What is up, everybody? It's Dr. Vibe here, host and producer of the award-winning Dr. Vibe show. As always, I'd like to say you're blessed, highly favored, a magnet for miracles, and a solution for someone's problem. 2018 Innovation Award winner given out by the Canadian Ethnic Media Association. Also, once a month, and this is significant, especially for this conversation, I host conversations for fathers that are co-sponsored, fathers and dads, sorry, that are co-sponsored by Dad Central, Canada's National Fatherhood Organization, and Dove Men Care. And as always, you know, I like to say you're blessed, highly favored, a magnet for miracles, and a solution for someone's problem. We're broadcasting live on November 9th. And uh, here in Toronto, the last few days have been out of bounds weather-wise. Like, uh, f got up to like 70 degrees here in Toronto, 70, 70 degrees Fahrenheit, which is a record for November 9th. And the last few days have been really good. I even got outside and did some outside painting yesterday, up on the ladder doing some painting on uh, the back of the carport. But hey, don't want to bore you. Let's get down to the main, main, main meal. The main part of the meal tonight. As always, you know I like to have new friends on the Dr. Vibe Show, and we are blessed and highly favored to have another new friend here tonight. His name is Derek Phillips. A little bit of background. That we're going to be talking about the Real Dads Network and specifically Black Fathers and Black Dads tonight, but let me give you some context. The Real Dads Network is the outgrowth of the award-winning documentary Real Dads, a Black Men and Fatherhood that goes back to the year 2000, which included commentary by the late and great Ozzy Davis and was directed by Derek Phillips and Nikki Dees. You'll need to remember that name, Derek Phillips, so that's your homework for the next two, three minutes or next hour, maybe. The purpose of the documentary was to show positive black fathers who were actively involved in the nurturing and the raising of their children. Thus in 2004, 2004, the Real Dads Network was founded by Derek Phillips. The mission of the Real Dads Network is to cult create a culture where all the fathers are actively involved in parenting and the parenting process and portrayed and viewed as exemplary role models by society. The mission you know what? There's a whole pile of things. <laughs> let me, so let me just do this way. I'm going to read the mission, and then we're going to get right into Derek because he's going to share his story. We're going to share real dads. But the mission is they have four mission parts. Strengthen the institution of the family by recognizing and promoting positive aspects of fatherhood in all media. That's why they're here. On my media platform, provide fathers with a support system that connects them to the resources which are designed to empower to be real dads, present providers, protectors, and peacemakers. Love those four Ps. Next one, advocate for shared parenting as the standard for public policy decisions. Collaborate with organizations to create positive outcomes for fathers and their children. So we do have the head honcho, the bottle washer, the CEO, the foundation of the Real Dads Network, Derek Phillips here tonight. Uh, you know, I could read his bio, but you know, you know me, folks. I just like to just bring it. Let the let let the let the friends bring it. So, what we're gonna do is we're gonna bring Derek on and say, "Welcome, welcome, Derek Phillips. What is up, Doctor Vibe? Doctor Vibe, thank you, man. Thank you, thank you for having me here. Thank you very much, man. Really appreciate it. Well, you always have a home here, and I. It's funny. I I was following the Real Dads Network on Instagram. And then next thing I know, this crazy man here from New York, you know, there's some crazy people, people in NYC, says, I want you on my platform on IG. I said, the only way I'm coming on your IG Live is you're coming on the Dr. Vibe oh, show. And I've been following you for a long time now. Yeah, well. yeah okay, so, okay, so here's my question. Why did you finally say, come on now? Like, what, am I, I finally did something right? Well, this, this is the first time I really started doing Instagram Live. Okay. I've been following your platform for a long time. Well, I am very humble, and uh, he had wonderful words, and I didn't pay him in Amer American currency, by the way, <laughs> to uh, to say about me and uh, the passion, because I don't consider it work, the passion mm -hmm. that I do. We had a really good, and probably like an hour-long conversation yeah. a few weeks ago, yeah. to the point that um, if you see the door open behind him, it's the boss of the home. And the real she, boss. The real boss. But I just found out a few minutes ago she's an ally. She's because <laughs> we, we are both putting the pressure on Derek to get something done. Yes. Right. So we 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 got we want to get something done. So joking aside, it's an absolute <laughs> pleasure and joy to have you here. Uh you have been passionate about 
black fatherhood, black dads for many years. So we want to just take time tonight to hear some of your story, the Real Dads Network story. So first and foremost, we want to do is why don't you share a little bit about, you know, where you grew up, et cetera, and uh, just let it roll. We'll just have a conversation. Yeah. You go for it. Yeah. I mean, when we talk about fatherhood, for me, a lot of it just um, goes back to um, when I grew up. So when I tell people, um, you know, I'm an educator, I'm retired um, assistant principal. But when I grew up, I'm the youngest of four brothers and three sisters. I didn't go to school when I was in, I played hooky in the first grade. I played hooky in the second grade. I got left back in the second grade. Um, I used to get beaten every day. And every day my mother used to say to me, please just go to school, go to school, go to school. So I would constantly tell my mother, she says, go to school, I'll give you whatever gifts you want, just go to school. And I said, okay, mom, I'm gonna go. I still never went to school. I played hooky in the third, fourth and fifth. And my mother said to me, she always said, the only thing she ever wanted in life was to see me graduate from high school. That was the only thing she constantly talked about. I just wanna see you graduate from high school. Well, when I was 10 years old, my mother died. And the thing is that my mother died when I was 10. And I remember that the night before the funeral, all the relatives were over at the house and there was this whole debate because my oldest sister who was 26, she took all of my siblings. She was gonna take all of my siblings. And there was a big thing about who's going to take Derek because nobody wanted Derek. Nobody wanted to take me. So I was, I remember crying on a bed that night saying, if I ever have children, because my father was not around at all. I mean, the story with my father is that one time me and my nephew, we were outside and his father was not around. We were outside and we were the same age. We were outside and these two men came up to us, you know, asking us questions and we thought they were our fathers. So they said they were our fathers. So we let them in the house and they stole our TV because we never saw a farmer. So at the funeral, the night before the funeral, when I was crying, I said to myself, I wish I had a father because if I had a father, then my father would be able to take me and I wouldn't have to go through this situation where people are debating about what to do with me, whether to put me in a foster home or whether my aunt is going to take me. But my father was really never there at all. He was sort of like in and out throughout my life, if that. So I remember saying, if I ever have children, I'm going to make sure that I'm there for my children. Mm -hmm. And when I had my two girls, I mean, when I had my daughter, I was very, very actively involved in my children's life. That was a promise I made to myself when I was 10 years old, that if I ever have kids, I'm going to make sure I'm a part of their life because my dad was not there for me. And I have been there for my daughters every day, wow. you know, every day. When they were born from the first day, I've done, I did everything with my girls. I mean, diapers, um, pampers, um, milk, everything. And it was to the point where people said to me, wow, you're Mr. Mom, you know? And it really felt so good for people to call me this Mr. Mom. And I was so honored to be called this Mr. Mom. And then I realized that I'm not a Mr. Mom. I'm a father, I'm a black father. And when it comes to black fathers, we call them everything other than what they are. So we're saying, you know, you can't be a black father who's actively involved. I see you with your daughters, you're constantly there. So you can't be this black father. I'm like, no, I'm a black father. Mm. So what I decided to do is that I said, you know what, I want to change this narrative about how we see and view black fathers. Because I'm like, I know there are a lot of my friends and a lot of fathers I see who are actively involved in raising their children, but people don't talk about that. We're talking about deadbeat naps. I'm like, no, that's not really what it is. I'm like, there are a lot of black fathers who are actively involved. Just because you don't see it, it doesn't mean you're not there. So I said, I took up my money and I said, you know, what? I'm going to do something about it. So I decided to do this documentary. I had no experience in doing documentaries, but I said, I wanted to do this documentary and I wanted to tell a different story. So I was fortunate in a sense to get Ozzie Davis on board and Ozzie Davis did the narration. And then we did the documentary, Real Dads, Black Men and Fatherhood. And this was the first documentary that was ever done that focused on positive black fathers. And as a result of that documentary, that's where Real Dads Network came, because we realized that a lot of black men really needed a place to go to have conversation, to have resources and support. So there, were, there weren't really any places for them to sort of like help, to get help. So Real Dads Network became that organization. And that was started in 2014. Four. 
2014. I just said 2014. <laughs> I said 2014 before 2004. Okay. So what I'm going to ask you is you went through, you whirlwind through that. And you know what? You're not going to get away with a whirlwind. There's some things we're going to chat <laughs> I was, about. I was waiting for you to stop me. <laughs> no, no. I, 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 I let people share their story, right? I like to give people space because that's another thing black fathers and black men need that they don't get a lot of times is space. And that's one of the reasons why I created this platform so they could have a safe and brave space to share their story. So very, very important. I want to cycle back to the young Derek. Um, no father, mother passes away. Yeah. Who gave you guidance during those years that you didn't have either of them? You know, and the thing is, is that I grew up in a very dysfunctional household. So my oldest sister, who was 20, she was 26, which is amazing in itself. She was 26. She had four brothers. She has five brothers and two sisters, right? And three kids of her own. She took all of us in. She took all of us in. So it was just, you know, I, I look back at it. I'm like, at 26, the last thing I'm going to do is take my siblings, five of them, well, seven of them, and then I have three kids. But the other challenge is that she was also a dysfunctional alcoholic. So she used to drink a lot. My other sister next to her was also had a lot of issues in regards to mental illness. So she was also an alcoholic and she was in and out of mental institutions. And my other brother next to my oldest brother, and my let me get back to my second oldest sister, she actually died from alcohol. She actually had a seizure in the house when I was 12 and she died in the house. My other brother was also an alcoholic and he actually died as well from alcohol because he froze to death. He was standing in his house and there was no heat and he was an alcoholic and he was drinking and he ended up freezing to death. And then I had another brother that was on crack. So I came from a very dysfunctional household. You know, but after my mother died, I made up my mind that I wanted to do something different. I wanted to do something different from what my family was doing. So in regards to where did I get that from, I don't know. You know, I just don't know. But I, at least when I was younger, but when I became a teenager, what sort of kept me out of trouble is that I remember my friend's brother who was in prison and he was a Muslim. And what he had said, you know, he was talking to his brother about Islam and I sort of got involved in learning about Islam and started studying Islam. So that sort of kept me out of trouble when I was in high school. So my whole teenage years, that's what really kept me out of trouble and gave me some of the structure um, to want to do something different with my life. What Do you have memories at all of growing up during that time? And and you, you can say whatever you want to this, but I do you still reflect back on your younger days? You know what I do, and which was crazy, is that here it is, I'm 15, 16, and I'm the oldest, I'm the youngest of all my siblings, but I am the oldest. So at 15 and 16, I had my niece, my nephew was a, we're the same age, and I have a niece that's maybe two years, three years younger than me, another niece that was, my, Bernie's had three kids, two girls, and my other brother had a niece, daughter. But I would actually, I was like their father figure. So it was days where I would discipline them and put them on punishment. We're three years apart. I would put them on punishment saying, you can't go outside. So here it is. Their mother would say to them, how come you're in the house? And they would say, well, Derek put me on punishment. You know, so to this day, they call me like Uncle Bill. And I was really that father figure for them because, again, they didn't have a father present as, as well. So I was like that father figure for them where I set the rules and discipline in terms of one, going to school, making sure they go to school, making sure they weren't cutting classes, um, making sure they weren't out in the street. So even when they would hang out in the street, if it's like 9, 30, 10 o'clock, and they were like with their friends, maybe like six or seven blocks, I'm coming around the corner and their friends are like, Uncle Bill is coming, Uncle Bill is coming. And they would start running the other way to get home before me. So it's like they were really like my children. So I sort of got some sort of guidance on how to be a parent based on really, in essence, raising my nieces. Wow. I, I already going to put this out to you. You need to write a book. 
<laughs> I'm serious. You should you should write a book. And uh, one of the one of the strong faithful of the Doctor Vibe Show, Nicole, is saying you are blowing me away here. So Nicole is a big time fatherhood advocate here in Toronto. So uh, if you're impressing her, you're doing good, my brother. You're doing good. <laughs> You said you realized that you had to do something about fatherhood. When did you realize? And if you do remember, when did you realize? And what was the catalyst for you saying we had you had to do something about fatherhood? Was it just all the experiences you had? Was it a specific experience? What led to saying, I have to do something? You know, I think a lot of it was just, um, you know, again, I just go back to one of the things that I've known since I was 16. 15, 16 is that I was a leader. So whatever thing that I'm involved in, I would try to take the lead. So even like going back to my household, here it is, I'm 15, 16, I'm the youngest of all my siblings. And I would put up signs in the house, you know, around the house saying, we have to have a family meeting, you know, and everybody's like, oh man, we have a family meeting. Derek is calling a family meeting. And at this family meeting, I was like, okay, I called everybody here tonight because we have to start acting as a family. So we have to start saying things to each other like, I love you. So when we see each other in the morning, even saying good morning to each other. So those are the things I did inside my household. And even like I said, as a teenager, I was, go ahead. Where did you get that from? Where did you, where did you get that, that insult to be a leader from? Because did that just, was it something God given? Was that something you got from your mother? Was it something from a relative with a friend or did it just happen? You know, um, some of the times when I reflect on it, um, I think one of the reasons why I think I wasn't going to school is because I was probably bored. They weren't challenging me. So, and I think it was probably something that was always there. And even like when I realized I didn't go to school grades one, second grade, I got left back, I played hooky, third grade, I played hooky, fourth grade, I played hooky, fifth grade, I played hooky. I started going to school on a regular basis, right? Probably in the fifth grade when my mother died. Sixth grade, I was on an honor roll student. Wow. Seventh but, grade. But, but, but did, who, who, who guided you, man? Was there anyone that guided you? You just did it on your own. I, I have, I, and I can't figure it out, but I just, at some point, what happens is that sometimes what happens as human beings that we're in situations and we say, you know what, I'm either going to be a part of it. I'm going to join the negativity or I'm going to just go completely opposite. And I decided to just go opposite. I mean, even to this, I didn't drink and smoke. Mm -hmm. So, cause I grew up with that. So I went the complete opposite. opposite. So I went through yeah. college, not drinking, not smoking. I didn't do any of that. How did you, okay. So you went to college. How did you finance your college? Did you do it on your own? It was college was for me was I, like, you know, I realized that I was kind of, I guess, you know, again, even going back to me, right? So I'm in honor roll, seventh grade, eighth grade. I'm in one of the top classes in the school. I stopped going to school again. I missed 97 days. I didn't pass mm -hmm. one class. Mm -hmm. Didn't pass not one class in eighth grade, yet they promoted me to high school. Just out of curiosity, is your high school still standing? Yeah. And then but in high school, I was, uh, then I went back to taking care of my business and I was at College Discovery. So I was one of the, I was again, put back in one of the top classes. There's Nicole saying you were born for greatness in such a time as this. Thank you, Nicole. So I, I, and I want, the reason I'm asking, when was the last time you went back to your high school? Man, I have not gone back to my high school at all, which is weird. Interesting you mentioned, I, I asked that for a reason because, and I don't know if I had told you this story when we were talking or sharing offline. A long story short, about three, four weeks ago, I got a, a, a note sent to me by a gentleman who I used to play football and rugby with at our high school. And he said, and, I, and incur I'm encouraging men to do this, but the, he asked, he said, hey, why don't you come out? A bunch of us are getting together for like a rugby reunion. Yeah. And I go, well, where are you going to do it? Oh, we're just going to go to the high school parking lot and hang out. I said, okay. So my mindset said, I'm only going to go for like an hour. Yeah, whatever. 15 guys showed up. Wow. And we stood up. We didn't sit down. 
we stood around in a circle and circles for four and a half hours. Wow. To the point that one of the gentlemen made t-shirts, uh, our high school name, Rugby Reunion. And I, I was just blown. There were some gentlemen that drove two hours. Wow. To come to this. So that's why I was asking if you have gone back to visit your high school. Even just go to the parking lot. No. I mean, I've tried, I've driven by it, you know, just the school itself. But, um, you know, in yeah. terms of going in, I've never really, since I left, I've never really went in, which is crazy. And the thing is that I used to live right across, directly across the street from the high school. My front door was directly across the street from the front door of the high school. Wow. It's amazing. We, we could just land on this, just your use for the rest of the night, but I, I'll wait for the book for that. So that's, that, that's all good. So, so let's get to the real dads network. What was the catalyst for you to form? Yes, there was the documentary, but yeah, that's the documentary. Why did you say, let's take it to the next level? What, what was the cause? What was the impetus? You know, for me, it was also one of the things I think also for me is not having a father was also part of creating that network. Because what happens is that what I realized just from speaking to people is that it was also helpful for me. So oh, even just, having just, by, just by the way, you already have a pre-order for your book. by the oh, way. You. <laughs> <laughs> But it helped me as well. So it helped me, it helped me in, in a sense of being around other men hearing their stories as well. So. A lot of times when we're talking about the Real Dads Network, we have our meetings. I would take this information because I didn't have that. I didn't have that father figure. So just hearing from other men talking helped me. I'm like, wow, other people can benefit from this. That's why we have the Real Dads Clubs, where we're just exchanging information because we didn't have that space and that place to go. Mm -hmm. So it really guided me as well and helping me be the father that I needed to be as well. How long from the time you thought about forming the Real dad's network to it becoming a reality? Um, the thing with me is that once I get something in my head, it, it happened. If I think of something, that means it already happened because I'm going. it's going to happen. So it's, you know, and, and I said, I didn't have any experience. I did have some experience with the documentary because when I started teaching, um, I was a history teacher. So when I lost my position, and then I came to this transfer high school, which is, you know, at-risk students, at-risk students, they say. And they said, can you teach math? I'm like, I hate math with a passion. <laughs> well, you, like, you, <laughs> you want me to teach math? I'm like, I hate it with a passion. But I said, I need a job, so I'll teach math. And I was teaching it. I was going through the book. I'm like, oh, my gosh, this is boring. This is boring. There's no way I can teach this. But what I started doing is that I started taking the rules and putting it into raps. Oh, I start putting it into raps. I start creating dances. So I would, you know, start saying, you know, addition, opposite, addition, opposite. This is what you do when you're multiplying monomials. You multiply the numbers, add the exponentials. And yep, yep. Like, what? You know, and it was, I'm not a rapper, but they would get a kick out of it, but they would get the information. And as a result of that, that's how I taught my class. So when I had students that graduated and they came back and said, Derek, I still remember your stupid raps. It helped me with my college tests. <laughs> so, well, at least yeah, you've left a positive impact on them, even though, hey, any, by any means out. necessary. And you know what I ended up doing? I ended up doing a show, a 20 minute show called Rapmatics. Recorded two songs. Recorded two songs. Okay, is this, is, can we, we got to listen to this if it still exists. You got it's it on, documented? It's, it's on YouTube right now. Okay. Okay. We recorded, recorded two songs. Have you heard the song, Can You Feel It? Can You Feel It? That funky sensation? Yeah. I spoke to Kenton Nix, reached out to the, the writer and said, can I use your song? And flipped the lyrics. He says, go ahead. Gave me a letter and everything. So I changed the lyrics and I made it, Can You Feel It? Can You Feel It? That mad sensation. Recorded two songs, did a whole 20 minute show, won first place in two festivals. Yes. And that was 24 years ago. <laughs> wow. You, there's so many different, oh, well, okay. Um, we'll still get to how the oh, network started. Years, it was two years before Real Dads, 22 okay. years ago. 
so we'll still get you the answer about the real dads, but I, I want to jump in just for a second about you spent 20 years in education. What did that, what insights on fatherhood did that give you that you've been uh, on fatherhood period? Cause it sounds like you had some diverse students. Yeah. You know what came out of it? And I think, um, a lot of my students didn't have a father, father figure. And what education taught me, those were my, those are my kids. Those were my children. And even, and that's how I treated them. I was an open book for them and they were an open book for me. They had my phone number at home, my home number. They would call me if anything was happening. If they were doing something outside of school, Derek, I have a show. I would go to their shows. Mm. So I was very involved in their lives. And they would come home, like even an open school night, their mothers, you know, would come to the school like, oh, so you're Derek. You're the one that, you know, John is talking about all the time. So I was very involved with them. And even to this sense that I have students now, former students that I'm still connected to who are 45, 43, 42, because it goes back to relationships. So I was able to build that relationship with them because I never had that father figure. And for a lot of them, they didn't have a father figure. So they sort of looked at me as that father figure that they always came to for guidance and support. That's, that's wonderful. So let's jump back now. Forming of the network, what, do you have memories of the first meeting? Man, I'm trying to think, do we have, I don't, you know what? I started with, actually, I started with a newsletter. Okay. So I started with a newsletter and then, you know, I started with the newsletter and then we decided to do this conference, this fatherhood conference. Okay. So hold on a second. You started with a newsletter. Then you said you're going to do a conference. Like how soon was the conference from the time you launched? Because Probably. most organizations would say that's a lot. That's ambitious What's depending it? on your space of time. A year. <laughs> wow. A year. And let me tell you, we did, it was, I hear it is, I'm like, I'm just, I'm trying to do this fatherhood organization. We have the name, we did the newsletter. And I says, you know, I'm going to do a um, fatherhood conference. Uh, we're going to have this workshop. And here it is. I was able to get on the panel. The pa This is the panel. Curtis Blow. Mm -mm. Um, Mtume. Yeah. Bill Stephanie, who was a president, former president, okay, <laughs> of Def Jam. Barry Mayo, who had Kiss FM. Uh, Minister Kevin Mohammed. And who was the other one we had? Peter Holliman. They're all on the panel. And we had, okay, this was a panel. And we had Wall Street, a huge article, huge one-page write-up in the Wall Street Journal in regards to this first conference. And the thing is that we didn't have, I think we had maybe 25 people that attended. <laughs> we had- but, but it was a success, you did it. Yeah, and you know, and I remember to this day, and Tume said to me, he said, he says, brother, I'm gonna tell you, he says, I see you kind of like, you know, you're out of it because you're upset because a lot of people didn't attend. So he was like, he put me to this side, he said, listen, let me tell you something. The fact that all these people that are here are supposed to be here. And he says, you know what, I'm going to tell you a story. He says, I remember going to a club we had in Minnesota, one of these towns. We There were two people in the audience. He says, but regardless of who is in the audience, you still have to give, you still have to perform. And those people who are there are meant to be there. Absolutely. So it's never about the numbers. It is always about, you know, what you're giving people and what, what people can do who are there. So never focus on numbers. I'm like, you know what? Um, Mr. Tume, you're right. So, and that we had a we had 25 people, huge write up in the Wall Street Journal, and that was really um the beginning for us. Right. You you've been involved in the fatherhood, black fatherhood, and black dad journey for a long time. Uh, what has been a what was okay? Let when did you know, or when did you have a feeling of I'm onto something here? Now I don't know if it. Maybe you've been the conference, 25 people. Yeah. doesn't sound like you're, but where did you see your first yes in the Real Dad Network journey? Um, Boy, I, I still don't feel we've reached that yet. I still feel as though we have a lot of, 
we have a lot of work to do. Yes, but you've had you must have had some successes along the way, even little ones. We've had, I mean, in regards to success, I think, um, I mean, we, I would say um, the daddy daughter dance. You know, let's say with the daddy daughter dance, we've been doing that for over twelve years. I mean, how did that start? The daddy daughter dance started for us as I mean. I have my two girls and trying to figure out some activities to do. And I remember speaking to Andrew Morrison and he said to me, so, you know what, Derek, um, you know, I do a, um, with the Girl Scouts with my daughters, we've done daddy daughter dances. And I'm like, wow, you've done daddy daughter dance. He said, you know, well, you should do a daddy daughter dance. So I said, okay, fine. I'll do a daddy daughter dance. So I did the daddy daughter dance, which was very successful. And we were able to, this daddy daughter dance, we've been doing it for 12 years. We've influenced Philadelphia, Joel Austin, to do a daddy daughter dance. I gave him my paperwork to do a daddy daughter dance. We influenced Jackson in Chicago to do a daddy daughter dance. We influenced Virginia to do a daddy daughter dance. We've indirectly influenced several other cities to do a daddy daughter dance. Um, we do a real dance week where for a whole week, we're the only organization in the country for the last 12 years where for a whole week we celebrate black fathers. We've given away over 256, 50 awards to fathers and other fathered organizations. Uh, we did a thousand dollar scholarship that we've given to a high school, graduating high school senior. You know, so we've done, we've had a lot of success along the way, but in terms of, I look at it in terms of where I feel we need, I would like to be. And I feel as though we haven't really gotten to that point. And I think a lot of it I attribute to the fact that it's been very difficult for me to juggle um, being an assistant principal raising my two children and then the fact that my job i have to drive an hour and 15 minutes each way so most of my day is spent two and a half three hours spent in the car work you know going back and forth to work and then dealing with a very demanding job and then having to raise my children and i'm married i've been married for 27 years to my congratulations husband, my sweetheart so trying to juggle all of that i feel as if i never really the organization has never really gone to that point where i feel it should go you know, so, but we've done a lot, you know, and we've done a lot. We've influenced a lot of people. You know, a lot of people have come through the Real Dads Network. A lot of leading people that are doing fatherhood work have come through the Real Dads Network. Kenny Braswell. Kenny Braswell was with Real Dads Network. Kenny has been, if you look at, if you go online and punch in Fathers Incorporated Real Dads Network, Kenny has been a part of my Daddy Daughter Dances and Real Dads Awards for seven to eight years. Sean Dove. John Dove yep. had Proud Papa. He had Proud Papa magazine. So when we had our first event at that church um, with um, two of in those panels, Sean came to me and said, listen, can you hand out my Proud Papa magazine? You know, and Sean has been tied to us. Um, um, Scott Leach, who runs a father initiative for the um, New York City. So a lot of these people have been tied into real that Tybidi Boom. You know, so a lot of them have been tied into Real Dads Network. But the challenge is that for me has been I had to juggle everything. And some people have come in through this network and some people have used things for their own, you know, personal gain. And that really said, you know, let me get back or acknowledge at least where stuff came from, you know, but we've been around. So um, but in the, at the end of the day, I say I don't care because at the end of the day, if you're taking anything from here and you're putting it out there to help other people and families, then my work has been, I've done my job. Absolutely. And it's interesting. I've, you mentioned people like uh, Kenneth Braswell. He, he's been on the platform before. Tabidi Boone, many years ago, had him on the platform. Still trying to get a hold of Sean Dove one of these years, but that's all of the conversation. Uh, I can ask this question to you, and I know I can get a, a value of a valued experience answer. Are the challenges that black fathers face the same when you were a young boy to the, what they are today? And if they are, what are the similarities? If they aren't, what are the differences? You know, I think this, the challenge is when I was young was um, not having my father there. So the biggest challenge for me was just not having him there and not having access and why he wasn't there, I don't know. 
Um, but in regards to the challenges that fathers face, at least with me back then, when I look at fatherhood over the last like 25 years, the biggest challenge was just also dealing with the narrative. We didn't control the narrative. You know, the narrative was always dads are not there, dads are deadbeats, they're absent, they're invisible. So those are all the things we constantly heard when it came to black fathers. Whereas today, I think with social media, social media has really changed the game a lot in regards to the narrative as it relates to um, black fathers. But the same challenges that black fathers have been facing for the last 25, 30 years has always been economics. In regards to being paid, we have a lot of fathers who are working but are still part of the working poor. You have a lot of fathers who are not really involved in their children's lives because they want to be involved, but sometimes they brought into the concept of what it means to be a father because the first thing they associate with fatherhood is provider. And if I don't have money, then I can't provide for my child. So a lot of those fathers are not there for that. But we're trying to change that now. I want to land on that. I'm going to respectfully interrupt you there. The whole area of provider, can you just speak to it that there's, when it comes, to a father, a black father providing, providing doesn't just mean monetarily. So even when we say um, real dads, real dads, we say present providers, protectors, peacemakers. Present is present is really about having a presence. Whether you are in the home or not, you have to have a presence in your child's life. And when we say provider, provider, when we talk about money, money is the last thing that we talk about. When we say provider. You provide so much for your child by just your being there, by your knowledge, um, by giving them, edu educating them about their role as men, as women. You know, so provider is just so much more than just um, the financial part. Financial is the last part that your role, that that's your role of a father. Uh, when you married up. <laughs> Way up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> How did that affect your mindset when it became to father a father? Because obviously you, you got married. I guess that was one part of the journey. Another part of your journey of fatherhood. I'd like to get your thoughts about when you got married and then also when you've had your first child. How did the thought process of being a father change with those two events? You know, for me, um, my wife has been huge. You know, I mean, she's been huge throughout this whole process and she's really helped me to evolve as a father. How you so? Know, um, so let's say, for instance, my wife, when I grew up, we used to have we had like when we ate dinner, everybody ate dinner. We were all over the place when we eat. Um, I would be in the room over here. My brother would be in the room over there. My sister would be in the room over there. We never really sat down to have dinner together. My wife was really big on, we're going to have dinner tonight, and every we're sitting down every night. She's really big on every night we have to sit down as a family and have dinner. So what that did for us is that that was huge because it gave us the opportunity to engage in conversation. Every night, we spent time with our children at the table eating dinner. So they were, only time we didn't eat together, if they I was working or my wife had something to do, but we made it a point where every night we ate dinner together and had a conversation. But that I attribute to my wife because that's what she grew up with. I didn't grow up with that. Mm. It's it's interesting the impact of the your your the person you married up, the up person, the up and, and, and it really is married up because when I grew up, I grew up, I wasn't exposed to a lot of things. Yeah, that's what my I'm sort wife, of getting here. My you, wife you, was exposed to a lot. She, you know, she took vacations. Yeah. She was able to travel around the world, you know, various places. I never would, for the first time in my life, I got on a plane when I was 21. Wow. You know, so even just being exposed to various things, I never, you know, knew a lot of these things. So she, being with her, and it really is marrying up. Mm. Because I grew up poor. <laughs> I didn't grow up, you know, poor in terms of exposure, not having anything, having to. I remember when me and my nephew, we had six pair of pants. We had wow. a, he had three. I had three. So that meant we had six. <laughs> OK. 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 I, I want I want to pull out one or two things about black fathers. That I'd love you to address. And recently I hosted a conversation for Dad Central about 
um, fathers and dads raising their kids if they're divorced or separated. Would love to get your thought process on that because for me, it was an incredible conversation. I was privileged to host, but I don't think it gets addressed enough. And there are a number of black fathers I know for whatever reason are not with the significant other or the wife or ex-wife. What are your thoughts in regards? How can they be present and provide presence in their child or children's lives in those sort of circumstances? So one of the things that um, I would say is game plan. So when we have our Real Dads Club meetings and we have dads that are coming to the club meeting for the first time, what we tell them is that in regards to this meet club meetings, one, we do not bash women. Two, if you're thinking you're coming to a place where you're going to have a bunch of men who are going to talk about, oh, women are this and women are that, you've come to the wrong place. So we tell them at the end of the day, you have to have a game plan when you're dealing with the mother of your child. So if your goal is, okay, I wanna be able to spend time with my child, that's my ultimate goal. So therefore you have to have a game plan. So therefore you have to say, okay, listen, I know I can't say this or I can't say that. If she says something to me, this is how I have to respond because at the end of the day, the goal is for me to spend time with my child. So you have to go in there with that game plan because you got to stay focused on what your goal is. So she says something to you that's going to trigger something that's going to cause you to respond in a certain way that may prevent you from seeing your child, then you can't respond that way. So you have to have a game plan. You have to be very clear on what it is you want. And you also have to have a relationship with the mother. Regardless of what happens, that is the mother of your child, and one, do, do not ever speak negative about the mother in front of that child. Even if the mother is saying something negative about you to the child, you do not respond to the child and say, well, your mother is this or your mother is that. You have to have a game plan to say, I want to spend time with my child. I am not going to say anything negative about this child, about the mother of the child to the child. So we tell fathers that you have to stay focused. If you need to explode, if you want to kind of like vent, you can come to the group and vent. And then we're going to guide you through that and say, ultimately, what is your goal? At the end of the day, you're going to have a relationship with that mother for the rest of your life, and the child's life, because that's what you guys have in common. You have a child and both of you guys need to raise this child because at the end of the day, statistics says children do better when both parents are involved. So you have to work hard to make sure you're involved in this child's life. Great answer. Great answer. And I just want to ask, as we're just going through conversation topics, and Nicole saying, drop the mic, drop the mic, drop the mic to, 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 to the Derek. Wonderful. Uh, what are some of the common challenges that Black fathers come with to your organization? Because I'm sure there, I, I, when I do my passion, because it's not work, my passion helping black fathers and fathers in general, but specifically we're talking about black fathers and black dads. Are there some common challenges you hear from them? Well, the most, I would say when you're dealing with the biggest challenge is dealing with the ego. And when you're dealing with men, you the first thing, because we're, we're socialized a certain way. So when you're dealing with these men groups, it's the ego is always there, the forefront. They always lead with the ego. So what you have to try and do when you're dealing with men is that you just have to try and listen, but try to get them to the point to understand that, you know, let's put your ego aside. Let's deal with the situation at hand and let's find out what are some strategies that we can do to get you what you need to get. And also that it's OK to be vulnerable because as men, you know, everything is, you know, I'm the man, I'm the man. It's OK to be the man. But before we become the man, let's just try and be human first. Let's try to look at things um, from both sides. Let's try not to focus on what the mother is doing. Let's focus on you. So if there's anything that's happening, we want to focus on you. So I had one of the dads that came to the club meetings, and he was you know, talking about, well, you don't understand. The mother is this, and the mother is not doing that, and this is, she's been doing this for years. I'm like, okay, fine. If she's been doing that for years, let's focus on you and let's focus on some strategies that we can give you. So this, therefore you can work on you. Let's not work on her because you can't control her. You can only control you and how you respond to situations in life. So the biggest challenge for us is just getting men to understand 
that it's not about the external because as men, everything is external, right? I got to take care of my family. I got to take care of the community. I got to do everything externally. No, let's slow down. Everything starts and it ends with you. So if there are any situations that are going on, we need to look at you and what you need to do differently. We're not going to talk about what other people need to do differently. What do you need to do differently to change your situation? Great answer. What uh, impact or how many black fathers and men out there do you feel are challenged by mental health challenges? Um, wow. I would say in regards to the mental health aspect how many of us and, and are you and are you hearing and seeing more of it man if i had to actually go and answer that question i'm almost willing to say almost 99 <laughs> percent okay you're being honest you know because i think what it is is that when we talk about mental health mental health and wellness there are a lot of different aspects of it so even when we talk about covid what's happening with covid a lot of us are dealing with mental health issues and that could be anxiety it can be dealing with um, stress. It can be depression. So all of those are mental health issues. And a lot of us are dealing with things in terms of, okay, how do, what's my outlet? How do, and that's been one of the things in terms of our Real Dads Club meeting, we've had therapists come in and talk to the group. And you realize a lot of people, are, a lot of us are going through stuff. And a challenge for a lot of us is that we feel as though we don't have anyone to talk to when it comes to the black community. You know, therapy is considered taboo, talking to a therapist. You know, talking, expressing your feelings is not something we do. When a lot of us, when we talk about mental health issues, a lot of us are dealing with mental health issues, but we sort of take a mental health to be a negative. It just means we need support. It could be at any point in time. We just need support with something. So it doesn't have to be a negative thing. It can be a positive thing. Mental health is a form. It's called mental health and wellness. It's a form of strength. So you believe in yourself. So I remember talking to someone that says, listen, you want to go to a therapist because all that stuff that you that you have going on that's holding you down, you want to take it out of you and give it to the therapist. Throw it at the therapist. Give everything to the therapist. And that's what you're doing during that session. All that stuff, you're just throwing it on the therapist. And then when you leave that room or that session, you are leaving all that stuff in the room with the therapist. So you're leaving free of that. But what the therapist is going to do when you leave is that the therapist is going to take all that stuff and just throw it in the garbage. But you leave free. See, and that's what we got to come to that mindset is that we have to be able to release a lot of this stuff that we have inside of us. Because as men, we have been socialized not to be expressive. Like someone was um, knocking Van Jones because Van Jones was crying. He was crying because, you know, oh, man, he did all that, man. But I can understand what he said. But why was he crying? Because it's OK to be emotional. That shows your strength. It doesn't show your weakness. So the big thing for us is redefining who we are. We are humans first. Mm -hmm. And it's a human characteristic to be expressive, to be emotional. If that's who you are, that's who you are. It's not a weakness. So, and a lot of that goes into the mindset. So we still, we have this fixed mindset where we fix on what men should be and what fathers should be. No, we have to get into this growth mindset. We have to expand the way we view ourselves. We have to expand the way we look at the world. It's different, you know, and it's not a weakness, it's a form of strength. Mm -hmm. Because of, now there's a book written by T.D. Jakes, I think, called He Motions, and the subtitle yeah. is Even Strong Men Suffer. Yeah. You, you talked a little bit about the C word that's happened through 2020. And I have a question. How, what have you seen the effects on Black fathers this year? In regards to the pandemic? No, I just yeah. In the how how do you how are they how from your position, you have a valued experience. You've been 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 in this journey for a long. How are they handling it? How, what are you what are you seeing? You know, with the challenge, I think, and that's why one of the reasons why um, we started doing virtual world dance clubs um, because people need a space 
So we, and you see now with social media, there are a lot of things happening on social media. Everybody is doing conferences and virtual this and virtual that with fathers. We're seeing now even like um, a lot of black therapists on social media now. So now that whole, that industry has exploded. You know, so there was one guy, um, he has he has a Facebook page where they have 750 black therapists. Mm. So now it's like, it's, you know, now it's becoming okay. But the challenge that we're having is that when we talk about what's happening with a lot of black fathers in COVID, it also exposes those who do not have access. So some of us who have access, we are going on social media and we're getting into the groups we're seeing, um, being a part of the Zooms and getting that education, but they are a huge population who they're really isolated because they don't have that access. Yes. They don't have that someone who at the barber shop or someone in the community who is saying, you know what? Hey, we have this meeting that's happening. Maybe you should come because we're not interacting with each other. So that group is really suffering from a lot of this stuff that's happening with COVID because they don't have a lot of those resources and access that some of us may have, especially when we talk about social media. I remember watching one of the um, programs about the school in North Carolina where the principal, he was on Ellen, the generous show. And he said they were able to get the computers to the kids. He says, but about maybe 20% of that population didn't have access to the internet. Mm -hmm. so although you gave them the computers, they didn't have the, you know, the bandwidth to even operate it. So we have a lot of people who do not have the bandwidth to have access to a lot of this information. So therefore they really need to have that community, to be able to be in the community, to be able to go to church, to be able to go to um, support groups, to be able to see people in the community. So that's the group that's really hurting. Even going to the father programs, they're not even involved in that. But that's the group we have to really try to find a way to reach. Mm -hmm. So true. I would be remiss if I didn't give you the opportunity to share what, what are some of the services that the network offers. So please do share us with our audience. Oh, so one of the things that we do, we have, boy, we have the Real Dads Club. We meet every, we've been meeting for the last seven months virtually. Okay. Um, every Thursday at seven o'clock dads, we have maybe sometimes 35, 40 dads that are just on this call. Mm -hmm. just you know, just talking about, you know, where they are, um, talking about, you know, whatever's happening with them at that particular time. So it's a really support group for dads. Um, we've done resources. We've done um, the Real Dads Vote Campaign. So we've been really pushing the importance of voting. Uh, we did a video on that. We also did a um, Black um, Fathers United for the Census. You know, also just reaching out to people about the importance of the census. Um, the Real Dads Club, we also have the speakers coming in, deal with topics on health and wellness, financial planning, um, building better, better relationships. So we just try to see where dads are and try to support them in any way that we can. We're also embarking on doing a um, prostate and colon cancer campaign. So one of the things that bothers me, right, and this is this is where this is coming from. Here is Chadwick Bosman, Bosman, right, Black Panther. What did he die from? Cancer. Cancer. So you would think that that would be like, wow, we have the Black Panther who died from cancer. Cancer is one of the leading causes of death for Black men in the Black community. Yeah. How come that we didn't all come around and say, you know, we need to unite around this cause? Because that's something we could prevent. And what's happening when it comes to cancer is that people are starting to be affected at a younger age. You know, so therefore, one of the campaigns that we're really pushing is that part of being a real dad is that you really have to be there physically, mentally, and emotionally. You have to be there. And part of being there is taking care of your health. You got it. You got it. This is, uh, man, the time is just flying by here, and I haven't seen the door open behind you yet, so I'm going to squeeze squeeze every little moment I can out, out of you in regards to this. Uh, what? Give me a story of a father that impacted you in the last year. Um, a father that impacted me in the last year, I would have to say um, one of my dads called me, boy, last week. You know, and he was going through a lot 
And he says, listen, my son is 28. And I'm just feeling like, you know, I can't really talk to him. We don't have a relationship. You know, his mother's been saying all these things about me all these years. And I, he hates me. And I'm try, I want to have a relationship with him. But, you know, we go back and forth and, you know, we argue, we fight. And he said, you know, he signed up for counseling. Oh. And I'm like, wow. Oh. And, you know, so he, they signed up for counseling. I'm like, and your son went? And his son is 28. He's like, yeah. So he said he went to counseling. And then the counselor asked him a question in regards to um, did he ever hit his son growing up? And he said, yes. And the counselor said, you know, they asked her the same question. She says, yes, I did. But I don't do that anymore. And she compared the way he disciplined his child with like slavery. So if you're beating your kid, that's like slavery. Yep, yep, yep. So, and he's, and after that, you know, what happened with him is that he stopped with the counseling. <laughs> he stopped with the counseling because he said the, count, the, the counselor, the therapist was being, he didn't like that comment because she was comparing him to slavery and saying he was being abusive to his kid. Wow. Um, yeah. So, and he said, you know, that wasn't right for her. She shouldn't have said that. So he got upset behind it. So I had the conversation with him and I said, okay, listen, what she did for you is that she opened the door for you. Uh -huh. so you got to, she opened the door for you and she told you, yes, I'm with you. I used to discipline my child the same way. But now I realize that wasn't the right thing to do. So I had to change my behavior. And I don't do that anymore now because it's comparing, it's like slavery. So she opened the door for you. And what you needed to do is that you needed to go through the door and say, you know what? You're right. Uh -huh. You're right. And the fact that it's coming from you, you and you're, you're a therapist and you're saying this. Yeah, you're right. And I, now I realize that that wasn't the right thing to do because your son is suffering from that pain, still has that pain. And he needs to hear you say, you know what? I've done some things in my life that I wish I could have changed. Now that I realize what it is, I need to do it differently. Right. You know, and even I said, even in regards to the relationship with the mother, do not tell the son that his mother is negative. All the stuff that his mother did, what you need to tell your son is that, you know what? I realize I wish I could have done some things differently. And now I'm trying to do it differently by going to counseling. Uh. So when we, after the conversation, he got up the phone and he said, you know what? I'm going to call that therapist back right now. Because now I realize what it is she was trying to do for me. And I'm going to let my son know that, you know what, even if there were things that I didn't do then, and I understand how you feel, you may be feeling a certain way, but you need to know I'm not that same person. Mm, I am exactly. not that same person. Good. I've grown. And Good. I acknowledge the fact that some of the things that I've done may not have been appropriate, but you need to know that I have grown. And I'm willing to listen, to hear you out and not to say, well, it was your mother, this, your mother, that. But now I have grown. And that's what his son needed to hear. You know, I can't go back and change that, but I can acknowledge what it is and say that I'm willing to grow. And that's why I say everything is about growth mindset. You know, mm -hmm. we have to grow and we have to be honest with ourselves because if we're not honest with ourselves, we don't allow ourselves to grow. That's good. That's really, really, really good. Are you now you'd mentioned that you have a lot of gentlemen coming to these weekly calls. Have you seen an uptake in numbers during this year? Oh, yes. You know, when we used to have, which is, uh, we used to have the um, club meetings, you know, face to face, and we would get maybe 10, sometimes 11, you know, and dads would show up. But they would come, when you're dealing with men, the thing is, they come in when they're in need. You know, and that's always been the thing when I talk about the Real Dads Network in a club, we want to make sure we have a place for them to come. So we would have dads that would come when we would have the physical meetings. You might come this month. We, may, we were doing it once a month. You might come this month. We may not see you again into the next four or five months. But that's fine because at the end of the day, what men need to know is that they have a place to go. They're not being judged. They're always welcome. And this, they're always family. So that's why it's so important with men because men are very, 
Men are led by the ego. So they need to know that they're very funny, but they do want to be able to be in a platform where they can talk and feel welcome. So what we do is like, listen, we don't judge. We're not asking you, how come, where were you for the last two or three months? You should be it. No, whenever you're in need, you know, we're here. And what happens is that what they've done is that they've spoken to other men and said, you know what, you need to go to the Real Dads Club meeting and you need to speak to those brothers and you need to have a conversation with them. Wow. What do you, well, how do you feel about the, and we talked about this when we first spoke offline, the number of fatherhood groups that are coming out of the, the yin yang these days? You know, I mean, I think it's, I have a lot of, you know, what we have, you have the social media part that we have. <laughs> so the social media part, you know, I think it's, um, you know, it's good, you know, because in regards to what they're doing in regards to the narrative. Okay. You know, so they're trying to change the narrative. They're using their platforms to change the narrative. So I think in essence, you know, and I've changed a lot in regards to my thoughts around that. And it's, it's positive. So, you know, and, and it's positive. Um, but I think what has to happen is that people have to understand is that that is that, is that that's social media, that's really not real world. So when those dads are going through some real issues, it would be nice if those groups can help them, but they don't have the capacity to do that, which is fine as well, because we need to have multiple pathways to connect with people. Yes. So if you're able to do that, and yep. you have a dad that's coming to you, then we all have to be on the same page. So, you know, that's not what I do. But yo, go here, go to Derek. Go here, go to fatherhood is lit. Go to this, go to da the dad's group. This is what they do. And be okay with that. Yeah. And, and that's part of the challenge is that we want to be the one. And we don't want to say, you know what? No, nah, I got to direct you there because that's what they do. You know, and at the end of the day, it's not about us individually, it's about us collectively. That's why I say people who have come through here, whatever you take, you take. I I'm fine with that because at the end of the day, it's not about me. If you're helping someone else, that's all that matters. Like mm -hmm. even with the Real Dads Club, I don't run the Real Dads Club anymore. Mike, Uncle Mike runs the Real Dads Club. I said, Mike, I need you to run the club. One, because you're better than me when it comes to this. You know, you know how to navigate it. You do it well. So I want you to be the leader of that club. And I want people to know that you're the leader of that club. Because at the end of the day, I know it's not about me. If there's someone that's there, that's more effective in doing it, let them do it. Yeah. You know, let them do it because at the end of the day, the goal is how are we helping and impacting fathers and families? Yeah. Just want to shout out to another faithful supporter of the Dr. Vibe Show, Dr. Tachi. She hosts the livest live stream about media, tech, and pop culture on Wednesdays at 5 p.m. Eastern time on Instagram Instagram Live, and then at 6 p.m. Eastern time on Wednesdays. It's on Facebook, LinkedIn, Periscope, WJMS Radio. And I think I got everything covered. Dr. Tachi will tell me if I didn't get anything covered. She'll, she'll give me a knock. Is it Tachi? Tachi, her, 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 her full name is Tachiada. Tachi she is Dr. Tachi, wonderful Dr. Tachi, lady. How are you? How are you? Yeah, and if uh, great insights on media, fantastic stuff, and great producer Curtis Brooks. They do fantastic stuff and doing it for a long period of time. Respect both of them. Young man, what's next? What's next for, for the journey? Uh, well, you know, the journey is to really uh, make this a network, you know, and to really open it up to um which i would like to at some point go to different cities and different states and to expand the work um and also just to um open for it to be a network and to bring other organizations and people involved around this network and um at the end of the day our goal is how do we impact fathers and families we're open um i've known very early on that it's not about me you know and whatever i have we share mm. What would have happened if this young man, Derek, didn't hold the family meetings <laughs> when he was 15, 16 years old and probably get some pushback once in a while from 
some people. Where would have what would have happened with Derek if he didn't have that focus at a young age? You know what? Um, that was that was my destiny. I was destined to do what I'm doing, you know, because even like, you know, I look and I haven't really reflected, but now as you're talking about it, I reflect on it. Like even my um cabinet, right? My um closet door. I had up there a picture. I wrote something up there, our community, my our community center. Mm. So this is something that I had on my dress, you know, closet door when I was 15, 16. You know, so that's something I always wanted to do. So, and even when I was in high school, I received, oh my gosh, I think I received maybe like 12 awards at graduation. Wow. Do you still have them? Yeah, I still have community awards. Community. I was community awards. Book, 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 so book, I was always book, <laughs> book. <laughs> coming. But I, this has always been something I've been passionate about. You know, I was, I mean, I was part of the Rapmatics. I actually did on Channel 9 when I was in high school. Um, I did an editorial about peace. Yeah. You know, so um, but this is something I've always known. So just you're you're, you're right, Maddox. So Nicole Waldron is such a supporter. For those who are watching the replay on video or watching it live, there's the actual link that you can go see it. Oh, that's the Rap Maddox link. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> right. And Dr. Tatch is saying, "Wow, it's such a young age." And then Nicole is saying, "I'm so inspired tonight." Oh, thank you, thank you. <laughs> So this is wonderful. So as we wind down the epic conversation, uh, it's periodically I do this sort of close with in wonderful individuals like yourself. So we're going to go in stages. Uh, your call to action slash message to these different groups. First of all, what is your call to action or message to non-melanated individuals when it comes to black fatherhood? Mm. What is my, you know what, um, what unites us is um, family, you know, um, and fatherhood. So regardless, we all have the same story. We all want the same thing for our children. Um, so in order for this to work, for us to work as a community, everyone has to just do their part. We all have to be on the same team. We just focus, our focus is on black fathers because of that is one, an area where I am more connected. Um, that is an area where I feel needs, uh, where black fathers need a lot more help. And we can also understand that because uh, when we start talking about systemic racism and all the different challenges and barriers that they have had to overcome or are still trying to overcome. So for anyone, whether regardless of what ethnic group or racial group you belong to, it's about fathers and family. It's about how do we work together to uplift our children. So we're open to working with everyone. We don't um, discriminate against anyone. If you're into the area of just uplifting people, then we can all work together. Okay. I'm going to give you some more groups, but Nicole has a message for you. Now we have to give a shout out to your wife. I can tell already she's an amazing woman. Woman, Thank you for sharing tonight. Well, said, she's, Nicole, hold yeah. on, Nicole, let me just say something about my wife, all this amazing stuff. She's the reason, and she is behind the name Real Dads Network. Ah. So that's, she came up with the name. Wonderful. <laughs> so, so, all right. <laughs> so your, a message to, a message or slash call to action. I'm going to say, okay. The black community, I have, and I'm going to subset it, but just in general to the black I don't like using community, black environment when it comes to black dads and black fathers. You know, I think when it comes to um, the black community, I think, um, again, I'm, I'm gonna go back to, you know, we really have to work together. In order for us to make the change that we really need to make, we have to work together and really come to this understanding that it's not about us individually, but it's about us collectively. And one of the things that really bothers me when people sort of like grab, hold on to everything, like it's my, 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 mine. This is my platform. This is my group. No, if your goal is that you want to uplift fathers, black fathers and families, then it's not about you. It's about us. So you have to be able to share those resources that you have with other people, because when we all put our hands together, that's what makes it work. 
Okay, two last groups. Second last group, call to action. When it comes to black fathers, your message to black mothers. To black mothers, what I'm going to say is be patient. Be patient with a lot of our men um, because a lot of our men are still trying to figure things out. And um, what groups, you know, one of the things I say that, and I say that because with the Real Dads Club, we do understand that there are a lot of men who come in there with some negative thought processes. And we're really working to get them to understand that women are not the problem. The problem is them and getting to the understanding that in order for them to really strengthen our families, we first must understand ourselves and we must grow. So be patient with us. We're trying to understand and learn this. Um, and we know we would not be where we are if it wasn't for um, women. And I give all the credit and the work that I do um, to my wife because she's been very patient with me. Believe me, she has. <laughs> Okay, and then finally, well, I just added another two messages. So I'm gonna put off the last group and slide in this last uh, second last conversation topic. What have black fathers said to you about the recent election? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> or do you want to save that to another conversation? Mm, that's you know it's like um man i think um we had one of the dads we had a whole conversation last week about ice cube and um his support for trump um and it's like um it's like wow but you know what at the end of the day you know what i say to people is that people have their own opinions and I think what I tell black fathers and all people is just that we just have to look at the facts, um, look at what's really happening in our communities. And sometimes when you're dealing with, when we talk about voting and stuff like that, sometimes people look at it as an individual perspective. Well, it's gonna help my bank account. Like 50 cents said, you know what? I don't wanna go from 50 cents to 22 cents. So this is gonna be money taken out of my pocket. But you know what? It's not about you individually. It's about us collectively. So when it comes to this election, you know, um, one of the things we have to realize, you have a black woman who is vice president, a black woman. Do you know the impact that that's going to have, one, for our black girls? Black women, they have, they are, there are more black women or women in the world than men. So imagine an impact of our black girls being able to look at this black woman as vice president. You know what that's gonna to do to them on top of what it's gonna to do to our boys. So the conversation we've had with black men is to say, you know what, we need to make sure we do not say anything negative, that we do not act like male privilege. So one of the conversations with our black men that I said, you must make sure you know how to pronounce her name. Her name is very important. So you have to pronounce her name correctly so one of the things I said when it comes to pronouncing her name, here's how we're going to pronounce her name. I want you to say period. Then I want you to say question mark. Then I want you to say semicolon, semicolon. Then I want you to say comma. Say comma, comma la, comma la. That's how you pronounce her name. Wonderful. We got our, the, the teacher hat was on for a few moments there, folks. So, you know, right back to English class in, in, in public school. And the last conversation or last call to action or message, your message to black fathers and black dads. My message to black fathers and black dads are that, um, you know, we've come a long way. I think a lot has really changed. And I think we've done a very a phenomenal job in changing the narrative, especially with social media, with this whole cultural revolution. Um, and we see it all the time. Like you cannot, when you go on social media, there's so many images and you know about positive black fathers. So I think we've done a phenomenal job in that area. But we have to move towards public policy. You have to change public policy. Policies are the thing that dictates everything. So one of the things that we're really working on strongly is to change public policy. And we're trying to implement this shared parenting bill. Shared parenting bill simply states that if a mother and father separate, 
providing there are no issues of domestic violence or child abuse, that custody should be 50-50 because research says children do better when both parents are involved. So it's nice to have all the social media stuff. It's nice to show all the pictures of fathers with their kids. And that's nice and that's cute. But at the end of the day, we're not doing anything if we do not change public policy. Great, great finish. Outstanding, outstanding. Uh, for people who are watching live, I'm going to be, sh what I'm going to do right now is going to share the various ways you can get in contact with the Real Dads Network. I'm putting here their uh, website address, www.realdadsnetwork.org. Facebook, Real Dads Network. Twitter, at Real Dads Network. Instagram at Real Dads Network. Email Real Dads Network at gmail.com. And a thing called a telephone. <laughs> and you can call, you don't have to text on it, you can call people. One of my mentors says, make sure you give good phone. Leave it at that. Phone number is 212 875 7725. They are in the United States of America in New York City. Derek, it has been outstanding having you here to share. Well, you all, you. You, and, you and your fathers always have a home here whenever you want to join us. Thank you, Dr. Vi, for having me. This is the most I've spoken in a long time. <laughs> well, I told you, I got to give black men space, right? Give them space, make it brave in space, and we can chat. Sometimes we chat nonsense, but a lot of times we chat the good stuff, right? Great platform. Thank you, Thank man. You so Thank you. No really problem. You having me here. Uh, my pleasure. It's Dr. Vibe here. I'm the host and producer of the award-winning Dr. Vibe show, the home of Epic Conversations. I'm the host of Epic Conversations. 2018 Innovation Award winner given out by the Canadian Ethic Media Association. Also, once a month, I host live conversations for fathers and dads that are sponsored by Dad Central, Canada's National Fatherhood Organization, and Dove Men Care. If you're watching this either live or on the replay, I'm putting up my contact information. I will speak just the uh, website address for those who are just listening. And the website address is the, D-R-V-I-B-E-S-H-O-W, uh, Twitter at D-R-V-I-B-E-S-H-O-W, Facebook, the D-R-V-I-B-E-S-H-O-W. Go to YouTube, The Dr. Vibe Show. There, it's all there. So best place to go is the website, though. Website is where you can get all the contact information, watch or listen to replays of, at least listen to over 2,000 epic conversations I've done since, as I say, since time. So as I like to do, as always, I like to first fans, uh, thank the people who helped make this type of conversation, Derek and his family and the Real Dads Network. Also to thank Nicole, who was watching this right from the get-go, and also Dr. Tachi and others. If I did mention you, it's my head, not my heart. Always like to close off with this. Live your life as a dream. If you can dream it, you can make it. Sometimes you have to get smaller to get stronger. Block assumptions, then aim bigger, aim better, aim higher, aim wider. And always remember to give yourself grace. God bless, peace be well, keep the faith, and walk good, and thank you for your time, because time is the most precious thing you have, and I don't take it for granted. God bless.